thank you very, very much, Linda, for that uh, nice introduction, um, except for the slugs. But uh, that's very kind. And thank you very much for um, inviting me to talk. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure. And I was just reading the, um, your mag the Biodynamic magazine um, in my office. I haven't been into the office very much, so it probably came a few weeks ago. But uh, a really pleasure to read that, as always. I read it cover to cover. Um, and uh, this book, Rebugging the Planet, um, actually emerged um, a bit on a train um, because I was sitting on a train musing on the fact that I just heard some horrific um, statistics about the trends in insect losses um, globally. There was one particular trial, long-term trial in um, Germany, which showed showing really dramatic declines. And those trials have been, those um, test sites have been going for a long time and they were seeing really, really huge drops in the number of invertebrates. And this was mirrored by other studies. And although we need more, we always need more studies. And a lot of the studies are done in, in parts of the world that have the money to do them. So there's parts of the world we don't quite know what's going on. So we need to know. But most of the science suggests that we're in trouble when it comes to invertebrates. Um, we are in trouble because they are so critical for our, um, our lives, far more critical for our lives than we are for theirs, obviously. Um, but uh, we are seeing such dramatic declines that they, they are suggesting that we're at risk of 40% of insect species at risk of, of in such trouble, they're at risk of extinction. Um, and there are invertebrate species that will, will probably do fine whatever we do because they're specialists or they're able to adapt, not specialists, sorry, generalists, able to adapt to whatever we throw at them. Um, but the majority of bugs do, you know, are being harmed by what we're doing. So that 40% is, you know, is a really, made my heart stop. And I'll, I'll explain some of the reasons why um, and uh, why that matters. Um, but what I was sitting in that train, I was starting to think, well, because I'm an entomologist by background, I did a master's in pest management um, back in 1989, which gives my age maybe um but i did I, when i did the masters it was looking at all different types of pest management alternatives to chemicals um back then we were, we were talking about alternatives a lot back then and biological controls which is what i i studied using a, a leaf minor fly host to breed up wasps anyway I'll, that's in the book but <laughs> you can talk about that if you want but um because i knew a bit about insects i thought well i'm going to write 10 things that people can do to, to save the bugs everyday things easy things and, and when I got to about 45 um, on this long train journey, I thought, well, there's something a bit more interesting. I made it into a poster when I got home um, to put on LinkedIn and, you know, share um, in the digital world. Um, and I and it ended up, I happened to be talking about this with somebody who happened to be working for a publisher it's called Chelsea Green, um, which you probably all know of. They do brilliant set of books, all sorts of um, things in, in lives and living and growing, etc. cetera. Um, but she said, well, we're possibly interested. This was in 19, it's sorry, 2018. And um, she said, well, we're interested in doing some rewilding um, briefing. So I you know, she said, that's interesting. And I forgot about it, but she got back to me. Um, and the, the end shot of all that is that um, they commissioned me to write this book. And I'd come up with the title, Rebugging the Planet, because I'd seen a book about rebirding. And I thought, well, if we can do it with birds, rebugging is a possibility. We can do it with bugs. Um, because rebirding was thinking about how we can rewild, bring the nature back into into um, uh, our lives, but also rewild in um, in terms of allowing nature to restore itself. Um, birds are critical to that, as are large species. But everybody forgets about the small species. Um, often people are talking about wolves, or you know, bringing back wildcats or large um, herbivores, and that's brilliant. I've got nothing against that. But most of us don't have um, a large estate or, or even a small estate um, or a farm or even a, a you know a large piece of land um, so I got to thinking well everybody is surrounded every day by wild things they're just very small um, and some of you no idea that they're, they're there because they're under your feet or they're you know several hundred meters above you I mean most people don't realize that there's thousands of bugs up above you flying or just being taken on the wind around around the globe there's a whole community up there but anyway most people don't realize they're surrounded by wild things um and so the idea of rebugging rewilding through rebugging 
everywhere just came to me and and then they commissioned me to write this book and so I started to investigate what the um what the issues were because I as um, Linda said I've been working on sort of big policy issues over the last few years so I needed to get my head into the bugs again um and so what I've done in the book is I've I've given some not not too much I hope but some of the details of why um bugs are in trouble um and they are in trouble they've lost habitat or habitat of, um where they need to um feed or nest or breed or um you know recolonize all those habitats have become much more fragmented or have been removed altogether um and the removal is a disaster because obviously then they they've got nowhere to live but fragmentation is a disaster as well because you might have a healthy community of, of bugs but if they can't recolonize if they can't move around if there aren't corridors that they can move through to new habitats and find new sources of food new new shelter new um mates to breed with you'll very quickly see a big decline um and they won't thrive as a as a um, population within a um an area so all that habitat loss is critical and we've seen it through intensive farming the loss of features like hedgerows forests you know rainforests um wetlands all across the globe really serious and a lot of it's to do with farming not all of it there's mining talk about mining impacts and a lot of that is also related to the pollution that those kind of systems create through pesticides fertilizers and mining really toxic pollution and pollution of the water system um so you've got all, all that happening as well um climate change critical um issue which has increasingly been um identified as a major threat to invertebrates in fact there was a um a piece of research in the uk just came out yesterday from bug life which is a wonderful organization to support if you can and bug life uh, were reporting on this research um which is in an independent um uh research journal um about the water species in the uk that are at critical risk because of climate change specifically because of the drought all the um, flooding, extremes of temperature, um, and, and how climate change affects um, the environment in which um, uh, invertebrates live. And as they're such small creatures, changes in temperature and um, precipitation and moisture levels are, are even more extreme, they're felt even more extreme. They're more vulnerable to those kind of things because they've got a very large um, surface to volume ratio. So they, they, they don't have the hearts that we have pumping blood around um they need to have the kind of temperatures that they're used to and when you change the temperatures you change the environment and, and therefore the amount of bugs that are around so climate change critical it's the one thing we could all do if we we're trying to do something about climate change we're helping the bugs um but then there are other issues um that i uh, identified in in the um in the book and i talk about um at length i'm not going to talk about length now but there's issues like light pollution and noise pollution both critical and i think light pollution particularly um understood better now um how it affects the ability of insects and other invertebrates to move around to recognize um a safe place recognize where they can um you know, particularly if those night um moving um nocturnal species like moths and they can actually they're actually now known to be causing critical um impact on um species that move at night so um light pollution noise pollution even um mobile phones there's a, a i do um report on some um information some research on the impact of very high much higher frequency 5g and above frequency on um invertebrates it's it's not totally well understood yet but those are indicating that it can because it's such a lot of energy within high frequency um signals that can cook the animals as they're traveling through it um you know it's it's just just too much energy as they're passing through so they've done a lot of studies on honeybees which obviously honeybees critically important for the economy and the critical you know so there's a lot of money in honey um and pollination services that the bees give so um they've done a lot of research on that so it's interesting to read about and, and have a look at that um so you've got a lot of a lot of threats um and i'm not going to dwell on that because i'm sure a lot of you know a lot about that but it was it you know it's really really worrying to read and in fact that chapter that i've written on the threat you know what's what's the problem um was much longer luckily my editor was very good and she she cut it right down so you haven't, haven't got to have too much gloom um, before you get to the good stuff 
Um, and the good stuff is also really, really inspiring to read about and for me to sort of remember what I'd learned when I was doing, um, you know, um, my studies on invertebrates, both in my undergraduate and postgraduate work, um, because they're so extraordinary. And, and throughout the book, I've given examples of how extraordinary are those boxes and uh, featuring different ways in which invertebrates are, are so extraordinary. And I did have a, a huge chapter on what we can learn from them. Um, again, it was just too big. There's too much to say. Um, you know, we can learn from them about how to communicate better, how to organize ourselves better, how to build better, how to not waste, uh, you know, all the ways in which in invertebrates um, live their lives. Um, there's things that we can learn from if only purely in terms of their design. I mean, there's um, th there's a beetle called the Diabolical Ironclad Beetle, which I think is a wonderful name. It's a large beetle, but it's almost indestructible because the exoskeleton that is, is, is the um, skeleton that um, insects have um, at an adult stage, um, which protects them and provides a um, means by which they can um, move by, you know, the muscles are attached to it, as opposed to us having an internal, they have an external skeleton. And the um, diabolical ironclad, it's made in such an extraordinary way that even if you um, put a car over it, it, it isn't destroyed. It's just so brilliant. And there's termites that I talk about termites quite a lot because I think they're extraordinary um, invertebrates. And they build um, ne uh, uh, nests that are brilliant at creating optimal temperatures and optimal um, levels of um, uh, moisture in their uh, in their termite mounds, which is so extraordinary, using electricity, using incredible technologies that we're learning from, and also learning about how to make buildings um, in sustainable ways as well. So anyway, there's, a, you know, and there's so many brilliant things that we, we are, are learning from them and how they interact critically with their environment, with fungus, with trees, with other invertebrates, with other animals. Um, I've got a, a, I look at the wood ant, which I, I've fallen in love with the wood ants as well. And they've done a lot of studies in the wood ant in the Caledonian forest and how they are actually a keystone species. And if you take the wood ant, because it provides such an amazingly important um, environment for other species in, and they, they are predators as well as farming um, fungi um, and so they, they, their nests provide a, um, a place for other animals to live. So anyway, they take the wood ant and you get infestations of moths that are critical to the forest environment and they get out of balance. So the showing that the wood ant is a critical keystone species for um, a forest like that. And it's, it's just wonderful to read out. Just as important as the wolf is the wood ant. That's what I think. Anyway, um, so I have these scary statistics and I looked at what they, you know, what we can learn from them, but also I wanted to explore why they're so important to us. You know, we, we as I said, we need them far more than they need us, or they do take advantage. They do take advantage of us being here to survive and thrive in, in many ways. I mean, if you think about um, the amount of food waste that we create, they, you know, a lot of bugs are very much into food waste and digesting that food waste and recycling it and allowing it to become more useful nutrients for, for other species, which then can fertilize the plants in which we absolutely depend. But, you know, they are using us as well. But in the reality, we absolutely need the invertebrates. And I, when I mean, when I say bugs, I should have said at the beginning, if anybody in, in the room is an um, in, in, entomologist, I, I give apologies, um, because I know true bugs are a very specific type of invertebrate, type of insect, in fact, whereas I'm using the term to describe a whole host of um, um, animals without backbones. Um, and I focus more on the smaller ones. So I'm not talking much about the um, octopi and uh, large crustacea. Um, important though they are, but I, you know, I have to sort of draw a line somewhere, but I, I, it's worms, slugs, invert, um, insects, all that. So talking about all of them. And when you start to look at how they matter for us, it's, I, you know, I could have written 10 volumes and not covered it. So I touched on the different areas. A lot we know that they are absolutely critical for our food production. Not only, obviously, in terms of pollination, they pollinate about forty percent of our food crops globally. Um, but there's some crops that don't absolutely need to be pollinated by invertebrates, but they don't thrive or they don't get as good um, uh, crop yields um, or, or um, uh, quality if you haven't got that pollination happening. 
Um, but it's absolutely critical for an awful lot of our crops, you know, even chocolate and coffee, you know, the, the important stuff. Um, but we would be having a lot, lot poorer diet if we didn't have the pollinating insects to pollinate our fruit and veg, etc. So that's a critical one, but it's also critical because the worms and the springtails in the soil uh, and other, you know, numerous millions of bugs in a, in a one small spoonful of um, small, small area of um, uh, soil, absolutely critical to provide the right um, environment for our crops to thrive. Um, the worms are providing, you know, obviously essential services in aerating the soil, allowing water um, to flow through, providing a fertilizing, fertilizing process by um, uh, decomposing the plant matter. Um, and they also critically move microbial, um, microbes and um, mushroom spores through the soil, as do other invertebrates that are motile, that actually can move around as opposed to the um, uh, microbes and uh, spores. So they, they provide a transport function for a lot of those really critical microbes, um, which are also important for our um, uh, plants and for our food system. So there's food, absolutely critical, and um, I'm sure you're all aware of the role of um, bees in providing us food, obviously honey, but also doing their pollinating services. Um, so we, I also talk about the fact, you know, we wouldn't have wooden chairs to sit on or wooden beds or a lot of our housing, you know, because trees, obviously, you know, that we have a lot of our um, lives are lived around trees and often we don't notice it. I think a lot of people, you probably do, but a lot of people I've spoken to haven't really thought about invertebrates being important for trees, for, for chairs they're sitting on. So you can talk about that um, as well. But there's also our clothes and um, you know, all those other products of the land that are, are, wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't be having um, such a rich diversity of food, um, uh, uh, of textiles or other materials that we have if we didn't have the invertebrates doing the fertility, the recycling, the water protection and the pollination services um, and the um, seed um, dispersal services as well as some species so that's critical they're also important for water protection um, when you actually um, look into the the important role that invertebrates have in terms of protecting fresh water and and ensuring um, seawater um, a, the ocean environments are healthy um, I did discover actually because one, one of my background is largely around insects and I found out that there's only one insect that lives in the ocean and that's called the sea strider. And it, it strides, as you can imagine, with that name on the surface, catching um, uh, drowned animals, drowned other invertebrates, even small fish. And it's, it's just such a wonderful animal with huge legs. Um, but the majority of um, invertebrates in the ocean environment aren't inver insects. There are other types of invertebrates. And one of the ones I looked at closely was the zooplankton. And zooplankton are the very microscopic species that uh, provide an incredibly important food source for all the other species in, in the ocean. Um, very much sort of, well, the phytoplankton, which is the tiny algae in the um, ocean, um, obviously the bottom of the food web, and then the zooplankton, the higher up, and, and as you go up, that the zooplankton are critical in maintaining a, a balance of phytoplankton within the ocean environment. And climate change is, is critically affecting that because it's eating up the oceans and affecting that critical um, uh, balance of species within the ocean environment. Um, but also in the freshwater systems, there's nematodes, there's um, a rotifers, which are tiny, tiny little um, invertebrates with a, a ring of cilia, and they're everywhere in the water environment, um, uh, filtering the environment and filtering out um, contaminants in a um, water filtration system that is based on nature. If anybody knows about reed beds, they were based on having a huge number of invertebrates doing the filtration um, uh, and cleaning the water system. I once visited Highgrove and I think they had a, a reed bed system for water filtration, water cleaning there, which I think is fantastic. Obviously, the more chemicals we pour into the water system, the more harm we're doing to those critical bugs. So, um, that's probably, I mean, I could talk, you know, could talk all about the waste control that um, invertebrates do. You know, where would we be without the carrion beetles and the um, animals that turn all our dead bodies into um, more digestible materials for the fungi and uh, bacteria and other and protozoa to break down further? 
you know, we'd be knee deep in dead bodies if we didn't have the invertebrates doing that fantastic service. So there's waste management, so there's water, waste, food, so critical for our lives. Um, and it's really, it's quite inspiring, actually, when I, you know, I hope you, if you do buy the book, um, inspired to read about what they do for us um, and how critically, you know, we don't know about most of it. Um, and obviously a final thing that they do for us, um, for about two million, billion of us in the globe, is provide a food source in themselves. Two billion people rely on insects as food directly. Um, and we're increasingly, I know, in the West, um, investigating how we can start to incorporate more insects into our diets. Um, insects in particular, um, not exclusive insects. We, a lot of us eat prawns, those are invertebrates, but um, we don't eat vast amounts um, as they do in um, other you know, parts of the globe. It's a critical part of the protein in diets in many parts of the world. Um, and we're investigating that because we think of it as a cheap, possibly more sustainable form of protein compared to um, animal protein, which is reared in factory farm systems. So the idea we'd, we'd be rearing billions of insects and killing them every day in a factory, turning it into powder and creating um, burgers from that. That's one thing that I think we need to be far more aware of um, and think about and have checks and balances and possibly regulations before we go headlong into that. And the other side of that is producing vast amounts of um, invertebrates for feeding animals. And it will be for feeding animals in intensive systems. So I very much um, don't favor that approach, but it's, you know, there's big investment, there's big players going into that, including the European Commission. And there's huge operations already producing billions of black soldier ant maggots, which they then kill, freeze, create into, into feed, and they're testing all these systems. Um, I feel very worried about that. Um, there's some encouragement that we've actually identified some invertebrates in law as sentient. Don't know if anybody saw that a few weeks ago, there's a new law which has an amendment to it, which includes lobsters and other um, large invertebrates, um, the marine invertebrates, recognizing that they have sentience. They can feel in a way which we should recognize and therefore have regulations how they are reared and how they are slaughtered. Unfortunately, that doesn't cover the smaller species. Anyway, that's a whole other area. I touch on it in the book. But if we go headlong, as we have done, into rearing animals for eating us without the checks and balances and without saying we can do this, but should we? Um, or should we instead eat less protein, sustainable protein, you know, pasture reared animals um, and waste far less food? We probably wouldn't need these things. Anyway, that's a whole other a whole other debate, Linda will probably say, so I'll stop there. But just going on quickly, because I know I will run on and on. So, Linda, you must shout at me if, I, if I'm i going over time. Um, but I, what the, the, the book did, very, I did want to very quickly get onto the um, parts of the book about what we can do, um, because there is agency. We can all do something. That's the good thing about invertebrates and rebugging. We can all do a bit, literally everybody, from a tiny child to anybody, you know, anybody anywhere. Um, because they don't need that much change in order to be thriving and to be helped. We can all do a bit. And so I talk about what we can do in terms of, um, firstly, about rebugging our attitudes. And it's interesting because this came to me as a sort of chapter because I've been talking about um, how when I, I've got young, I had young children, they're not young anymore, but how wonderful it was to see them come in, you know, running to the room with a handful of worms and how that, that one year we went into a lake and, and my youngest son got a, a leech on him. And I was so thrilled. And I said, oh my God, that's so exciting. You got a leech it's sucking your blood. And my other son went back, right back into the lake to get another one, to get one for himself because he hadn't got one. Um, and I know that's because I, I, I know that, that you know, it's relatively safe and all that. There's obviously risks with some insects. I'm not, I'm not um, dismissing all the very, very real threats to, to um, health from some invertebrates and we need to be careful. But in this environment, I knew what I was talking about. And most people know that the majority of, should know, the majority of bugs are harmless. They won't sting you. They won't hurt you unless you will hurt them. They're not dirty. Um, they're not going to pass diseases. Um, and you can control all those things anyway. So um, I think rebugging your attitude is about thinking about when you see a bug and if you're around other people, particularly young people, reacting in a different way. 
and so I talked about that and I talked about how how it would be good if people um, do react differently to bugs in in a um, particularly around children and rethink how you react and be positive and share what you know about the invertebrates and why why they're important and don't stamp on them and they're not dirty and all those kind of things so rebugging your attitude is a critical thing and and the scientists who've um there's a, a, a big study of i think it's about 80 global top scientists on invertebrates they did a big study and one of the things they identified is what was needed apart from all the research and they're always asking for money for research but they did identify that they need public support for invertebrate studies and in, uh, you know understanding better because so much of the science around invertebrates is how to kill them and i was part of that i did a, a pest management degree you know it's all about how to control them how to keep them out how to kill them with with um what kind of new technologies or chemicals um and so they need new research to to find out how we can look after them how we can live with them share that space with them or protect them so that part of that is about rebugging. And if the more you learn about bugs, the more you might be interested in helping them in political ways and getting involved in local um, bug um, hunts or bug societies um, or your park, friends of your park. So you might be interested in, in sort of getting the park keepers to use less pesticides or no pesticides and having places in the park that are really great for bugs, um, having those corridors through your gardens, say, you, you know, you know all your neighbors, you can create a real corridor. So that's all about sort of thinking that you you understand more about the the role of bugs and how they're not harmful and how you can help them. Um, so that chapter is is about rebugging your attitude, and I, I will start by talking about it because I I think it's really important. I've just realised I've started talking without stopping, and I do actually have a, a series of slides, but maybe I can get to those at the end because it does um, lighten the um, mood. But um, uh, no, I think I'll start with them now. Actually, I'll I'll, I'll go I'll go to them now, um, just to break up the um, uh, where is it slides? Can you all see that? Yeah, let's try and get it onto the uh, proper screen. There we go. Um, this is a vapor moth which landed in my um, kitchen, cut from the garden, and I just my son happened to have my his smartphone on my smartphone. I managed to take this wonderful picture of vapor moth. I just adore it because of those um, antennae. Um, hornet mimic moth, and this is a, a wonderful example to talk about with regard to um, rebugging your attitudes, because people might see that in the garden, you know, having a picnic or whatever, and then they, people shriek, because it's quite big, and it looks like a, a wasp or a bee, if you, if you don't know what you're looking at. Um, but it's quite easy, quite quickly, to recognise that it's not a bee, it's a fly, completely harmless, wouldn't sting anything. Um, although it's not harmless to the animals that it lays its eggs on. It's great pest control if you want a, um, a pest control agent in your garden. Hoverflies are great for that, but they're also good pollinators. Um, I'm just going to um, go earlier, previous, I'm not very good at, um, oh well, you know, I'll go forward. Um, crab spiders, flower crab spiders. I get a lot of these in my garden now. I'm really, really um, pleased to be finding them um, because I think they're just wonderful. They don't create webs. They're not like other spiders creating webs. They actually um, grab their prey with their um, uh, jaws and their um, hands and they then inject the prey with a venom and then suck the insides that they've um, liquefied. Um, and you might think of them as bad because you've seen them catch um, bees. Um, and they do catch bees, but they also catch flies and they catch other pests of and other um, the potential um, crop pests that you might not want um, laying eggs in your crops. And um, a wonderful study that I found um, that had been done on crab spiders and a particular plant they studied was actually able to, when it felt that it was being attacked by a um, herbivore, a herbivorous um, uh, um insect or um oh, I'm trying to think of what what they what it was but um probably caterpillars or something like that um or some other species i can't remember but anyway they found out that the plant could give off pheromones which you know uh, chemical cues that would attract flower crabs to this bush and the flower crabs would then catch the the um, flies it was probably flies that would be laying eggs um but uh it's just interesting to show that that communication between the spider and the between the, um, the flower crab spider and the plant was so attuned and so clever because at other points in time the plant wouldn't 
want the flower crab spider around because the flower crab would catch the um, uh, pollinators like the bees and the, and the plant would want the pollinators around. So they do it only at times when they were under attack. And there's so many examples of where um, of the um, mutual benefits between plants and uh, uh, invertebrates that have evolved over millennia, you know, many, many millions of years. Um, and they're so perfect and we disturb them at our peril, um, you know, destroying whole communities and whole relationships um, that have built up over um, billions of years when we just chop down a few trees in a rainforest. Um, but these, you know, I just think it's a wonderful example of communication. It's a mint moth. You've probably seen these in the garden. They're quite small, but I just think they're so beautiful. And it's on a mint plant, so I think they're quite neat. <laughs> and the spider, wonderful spiders, um, fantastic for pest control if you um, have particular problems with um, pests. As are wasps, obviously. I've had a wasp um, nest in my roof all last year, and uh, I kept watching them coming and going with huge numbers of <coughs> flies, which then macerate and feed to their babies. So wasps are fantastic pest control agents. And this was a Jersey tiger moth, which I thought was just so beautiful because I got both sides because it landed on my window, um, showing the beauty underneath and, and the other side. And this is a, another hoverfly. Um, I think probably if you live in an urban environment, you probably find you've got loads of hoverflies. I do anyway. And I've just made a pond which um, provides a habitat for, for a lot of hoverflies to lay um, their eggs. Because there's one particular one which is called the um, rat-tailed maggot, which is a really unfortunate name, but actually it's quite an accurate name because it looks like a maggot in the, in the water with a tail. And then it hatches out into a beautiful hoverfly um, such as this one, which I think is stunning. Um, and another spider came to my pond, so I was very pleased about that. It just shows what you can do in your garden. Um, here's, here's a flower crab in my garden, a flower crab spider eating um, the aforementioned bee. Um, this is a, a tawny mining bee, which I was lying in my garden resting, and I realized I had several of these um, buzzing around on the ground, and I realized they'd made the holes and they were laying their eggs in them. Um, and in fact, you know, it was stunning to watch just on a lazy sunny day, another hoverfly there. And of course the ubiquitous worm. Um, these are some illustrations I've just um, shown because they're in the book. Um, uh, I've had Ned Page, who's um, um, my nephew in fact, drew some illustrations for the book. And the middle one is the tardigrade, which you might've heard of. Um, it's a very famous, unique invertebrate. It's not an insect. Um, and it's in moss and many wet habitats across the whole globe. But it has this unique um, uh, um, ability to withstand incredible environments. It can be desiccated, it can be left, um, it can be frozen, it can be irradiated, um, it can be swamped, obviously. And, and they did resuscitate some um, moss, they also called moss piglets or um, water bears. Um, but their official name tardigrade, but they they regurgitated some that they found. They'd found a piece of moth in a museum, and re, an hundred years old sample of moss, and they rehydrated the moss, and the um, tardigrades were rehydrated. It's hundred years later or so. It's just incredible. They are amazing, and they're obviously being. I studied a lot to see how they managed to do all this, and this is a um, ladybird larvae. Um, so when the ladybird eggs hatch they turn to quite ferocious beasts so you know, like the dragons of the garden and they can munch through huge amounts of um, larvae and aphids um, and uh, do a huge amount of good for gardeners as I'm sure you're all aware and tiger moth caterpillar here just showing that there are also downsides because if you touch this this beauty um, you will get irritated skin so it's always good to be careful in, in many, some situations but learn which which are safe um, the holly blue, just a beautiful, beautiful um, uh, picture I managed to take in my garden. Every single one of these pictures I've taken in my tiny 10 by 10 foot garden in, in Hackney. And I'm surrounded by concrete, no, concrete or decking. So I'm trying to create a, a haven, but I can't at the moment create a, a corridor. So I don't get as many, I don't get many birds, but I do manage to get some invertebrates. And it's incredible what you can achieve for invertebrates if you manage it for, for wildlife. Um, Bucktail bumblebee and the um, and salvia plant, which is very popular. Um, and this actually isn't for my garden. I'd be lying if I told you it was. It was an uh, organic farm that I visited, 
um, last year when I was giving a talk, and I just thought it was so beautiful, um, Common Carderby. Um, and uh, I think it would be good to go to the beginning, because I did have some at the beginning, but I don't know quite how to. I'll go, go back to the beginning, just to have, have some at the there. So this was the beginning of my talk. <laughs> and there's a, um, a bee fly, which you will probably start seeing in March. They're fantastic. Um, there's flies. Um, this is the black bordered bee fly, um, do a huge, huge pollinating um, role, um, but they're also parasitoids. They lay their eggs on the eggs of um, bees, it, such as the tawny mining bee, which has got its egg down the hole. They lay their eggs and when the bee larvae hatch, the eggs, the larvae of the um, uh, bee fly will eat, eat its host. So it, they're quite amazing animals. I think there's a a lot of love for the bee fly and they're very fluffy and beautiful as well and this is what I, I was going to say I was going to cover um and some more um, invertebrates just to look at from around where I live um and uh so I was just going to finish talking um about what we can do um because I think it's really important so I'll stop sharing um and carry on just a little bit because I started to look at other areas in our lives that we can um, help the invertebrates. And one of the obviously key ones is in what we eat, um, where we buy food from, who we buy food from um, and what we buy. Um, and that's really, really critical. So I obviously talk about it in the book um, and it's what my work is, is all about. Um, but thinking about buying as fresh, buying organic, biodynamic obviously, um, and cooking from fresh and trying to buy as direct from the farm as you can, at least with some of your food. Um, and uh, we're working hard in my organization to try and ensure that more people can buy food more direct or through really better food traders, because that's critical, because everything going through the supermarkets, buying everything through the supermarkets and fast food um, outlets, et cetera, um, doesn't allow farmers to get the reward that they need in order to farm in agro-environmental friendly ways, which are bug friendly ways. It's very difficult to have more rotations in a farm and more habitats in a farm and more crops in a farm, more um, diversity of crops and possibly mixed farming with livestock and um, uh, cereals. It's very difficult to do that if, if your buyer is a really hard nosed supermarket wanting perfect produce at a particular time at a very low price. You just have to produce vast volumes of uniform crops. And that's true across the globe. And it's been the trends for the last 50 years. And that's what we need to buck against and as consumers we can do that every time we shop so I, I'm sure you were aware of that anyway so I don't need to talk about that very much and I do talk about what far farmers can do but there are other ways as well about what you can do with your um where you buy clothes um I will say that the um clothes that you're wearing now are probably the most sustainable you know don't buy anymore <laughs> if you can avoid it or buy second hand recycle or repurpose um, make clothes into other clothes or into cloths and you know all those kinds of things or share or swap I've been very heartened recently hearing from um, friends with teenagers um, a lot of teenagers are really into um, apps which allow you to swap the clothes that you don't want anymore um, and sell them and they're really used to that they do it so effortlessly um, in ways that I find much harder <laughs> In, with apps but they they just do it all the time they're sending their clothes off and, and, but you know in a way it's better to buy less um and the the idea of people buying t-shirts and just using them once and throwing them away is absolutely horrific i remember hearing that in a, a meeting about a year and a half uh, 15 years ago and absolutely appalling because when i looked into the role i looked in in detail at cotton um cotton is one of the ubiquitous non-food crops across the globe it's also one of the largest uh, um, hectare use of chemicals because it's an incredibly vulnerable crop to crop pests, particularly the um, cot um, cotton codler moth. Oh dear, my brain's frazzled this evening. Um, but uh, is it the cotton? Oh, cotton borer. Cotton borer. I knew I got it wrong. Anyway, I do talk about it in the book. You can read about it in the book. But um, you know, it requires a vast amount of chemicals because it's a, a monocrop you know, huge hectares across the globe. And we're using cotton in ever increasing amounts. It's just been incredibly popular. It's very lucrative. Um, and that creates huge problems. I mean, I talk about one area um, in Eastern Europe where vast areas of forests have been destroyed to create um, very um, large monocultures of cotton crops using a huge amount of water. That's the other problem with cotton. You know, you, you're obviously having to spray it 
it requires vast amounts of water. So whole rivers are drying up and lakes are drying up as a result of a huge expansion. And what water is left is contaminated with the chemicals and fertilizers. So we really need to turn very rapidly away from fast fashion um, and start to use off um, the materials that we use in our everyday lives. So I'm talking about textiles, but the clothes we wear in particular is a problem because fast fashion has become a really um, uh, easy thing for people to think about. They think clothes, you know, five ninety nine for, a, you know, a jumper or whatever. That doesn't mean much, but it does. It means a lot. And the flip side of that is that people, you know, thinking, oh, I won't have cotton. I'll go for plastic kind of um, uh, man-made fibers. Um, but that's a real problem too because those man-made fibers they're made from um, fossil fuels, and so they're effectively plastic clothes. So all those um, fleeces that you buy and everything, yeah, you know, a lot of the man-made fibers. They don't break down. They don't. They're not. Um, they're not very tasty to the kind of um, bugs and then the fungi and other, um, and bacteria that will break down a natural fiber like cotton or leather or wool, which are all vulnerable. As you you know, you've probably all had moths attacking your wool clothes. So what um, is the problem with plastics is they're not very tasty. They break down into smaller pieces and uh, create a micro microfiber pollution crisis. And over the last five years, you've seen more and more studies. As, as the filters that they get in the studies get smaller, they've realized how incredibly ubiquitous microfibers are and microplastics. They're in our bodies, they're in breast milk, they're across the oceans in every river and in the soil. And every time you wash, um, and particularly if you dry, you tumble dry plastic clothes, um, you are creating more microplastics and they go out in the water system. And, and don't get caught in the filters in the um, in the um, in the water treatment works, and they get into the environment. Um, plastics in other environment, you know, in other ways as well, in farming, in um, plastic bags, all those kind of things. But just thinking about the clothes you buy is, is a good way to help the bugs. So you can rebug your wardrobe um, by choosing organic fibers and textiles, reusing, repurposing. Um, sharing, recycling, all that kind of thing. So um, that's that's one thing that I think people don't often think about in terms of rebugging. And I, so I'm trying to get people to sort of um, repurpose their clothes. So that's the other area. Um, obviously, you're all experts at gardening for bugs. I'm, I don't need to tell you about that. We can talk about slugs if you want. Um, but you know, no chemicals. Making sure there's messy areas, there's wild areas. Leaving um, uh, the lawn to grow and to, to seed, to have some flowers in it. Um, like the no mow may has become very popular. I think it's a great idea. Um, but, you know, sometimes I tell people just put a, a lump of sticks, a, a wood pile in a small area and you'll find that you'll get beetles and you'll get all sorts of goodies coming. And if you can put in a small pond, anyway, you, you know a lot of this and how by creating a more diverse habitat and more places for bugs to thrive, you'll have a more balanced environment. So you won't get overwhelmed by bugs, um, by slugs, and you'll really create an environment that's very positive for plants to grow and for a diversity of plants to grow. And then you'll get the colors, the smells, the sounds of a, of a wonderful garden. But you're also doing a massive, massive job in creating a refuge for the bugs, which need a refuge, frankly, from, the, um, uh, from a lot of the rural areas which are very sterile and chemical filled and monocultures, et cetera. I mean, it's, you know, we have farmers here who are fantastic across, you know, across the UK and farmers want to do the right thing, but it's very hard because of the, um, the farm gate prices, they're squeezed by the supermarkets, but so we need to do all we can, but the environment in the rural areas is, has got ever less um, uh, attractive and um, livable in for a lot of the bugs. Um, so urban environments and urban gardens and parks, even the scrubby bits on the road and the verges, critically important refuges, which you know should be managed as such. So let's not have chemical um, grass verge spraying by chemical by uh, councils, etc. So I actually identified there's quite a number of councils which have banned using glyphosate and spraying of weeds on their um, uh, road verges, and uh, that's fantastic. There's some bee Free friendly towns like Monmouth, they're doing a lot to help the uh, pollinators in their town in all sorts of ways. And I do give examples of other um, places across the globe that are doing really clever things to create an environment which is really about sharing the environment with nature 
particularly with the bugs and with the people and everybody can see you know the smell and the um uh color you'll get from more plants uh, more flowering plants etc um being grown fantastic for everybody really and and fantastic for if you're particularly interested in the larger species like birds and other other creatures um, and mammals which absolutely rely on invertebrates as a food source um, or the source of their food through pollinating the plants that they eat etc cetera, etc cetera. we wouldn't have all the birds if we didn't have the bugs so that goes without saying or bats or if bats or mammals and voles are your thing so it all depends on the invertebrates and you can create in your garden um, and in your park um, a really really rich environment for, for them to thrive um, and there are studies that are showing that the urban areas are actually creating a really important habitat for a lot of bees, particularly solitary bees and bumblebees, um, because you have got gardens which can, you know, have quite diverse um, nectar sources for those bees. And uh, if the, if you create a, a corridor that they can travel through safely um, without being zapped by a, a huge wall or whatever, then that's been incredibly important and they can really thrive in those environments um, compared to um, urban environments. Um, that having flowering plants and trees and shrubs, shrubs are really important. And of course, with shrubs, you can also eat the produce of some shrubs. So it's, you know, thinking about all, all the different layers in a garden and a habitat are important. Um, and then finally, it's worth talking about some of the difficult things, because this is a, the problem for insects is a systemic one. Um, a lot of the um, issues that I talked about at the beginning are, that are causing problems for them are unfortunately to do with the way in which we don't have the right kind of governance of our societies and our corporations and the companies which have such an important influence on what is done to the countryside and what is done um, to materials as they move through um, supply chains. Um, and I talk about it in a chapter about power and influence. Um, some of the big chemical companies have far too much influence over uh, decisions around um, which pesticides are allowed and how they're allowed to be um, authorised, how they're allowed to be used, how much residue is on our food and things like that. Um, that, you know, for many years I've been working on this over the years, you know, Monsanto, um, now Bayer, uh, far too much influence. And some of that is being revealed now in some court cases in America, just how much influence they've had over decisions made by lawmakers. Um, undue influence on that and actually writing some of the laws you know they, it's just horrific what they've been allowed to do and the only counter to that power of those big chemical companies and those other companies which which uh, have too much sway of our food system and um, um, basically sucking the profits out the work away from the farmers as well um is to have a movement against so you know i do talk about that everybody could be part of a movement to have a counter to those companies and to be able to tell mps or lawmakers that um, you can do something um, and you should do something to um, support the bugs in those decisions you make about what's allowed in the environment and what habitats are destroyed. We should have protection for um, nature rich areas, for our particularly important key um, biodiverse areas. So if everybody gets more involved with organisations like Bug Life or the Wildlife Trust or Biodynamic Association, um, all of those organisations that try to influence the lawmakers, and to write yourself to MPs, then trying to make them see that the, the country and the population wants them to make better decisions for bugs. That is really critical. And, that, you know, so I'm talking about rebugging your politics. I think it's really important. But you can also do it at a local level. So get involved with the uh, politics of the local authorities, get involved in um, what decisions are made around the parks, around what's sprayed in the, in the environment, around schools, etc. Um, what, you know, what can uh, council buys? what schools are selling, uh, are feeding children, what hospitals are doing, what's happening in the land around, around you, um, get involved um, and always, you know, with a small P, but um, get, get active on that area. Um, and uh, that's critically important. I also talk in the book a bit about why we need to be addressing issues of poverty and inequality. And you might think, what's that got to do with the bugs? That's so far removed from bugs, but it's not. It's increasingly understood from the UN downwards that the more inequality we have, the more injustice and inequality of wealth, um, the more environment suffers. And if the environment suffers, if habitats suffer, the bugs suffer. Um, so I do touch on that as well. And we need to have a more uh, equal world, a fairer world for us in order to be fairer to the bugs. That sounds quite heavy. So <laughs> I do want to end that the, the book has a whole chapter on um, things you could, you know, the, throughout it has 
boxes of tips and ideas of things you can do and also you know interesting things about bugs um different types of bugs crazy things that have happened over the years and incredible bugs incredible communities of bugs but i also at the end have got lists of organizations that you can get involved with how to talk to your um to your mps or your local council um tools which to do that and to give you the confidence to get involved in that because that matters as well as what you do in your garden as well as what you buy um and how you talk to your friends your family your colleagues that's all absolutely critical but we do need the political change too so linda i probably should stop there i can't think how long i've talked for i can talk forever <laughs>